When you think about the police, what pops into your head? This? This? Or maybe something like this? Police are often portrayed as protectors of peace and public safety, but that has long been at odds with the lived reality of black and brown communities in this country. A grand jury decided not to indict three police officers in the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. Last summer was a breaking point in the wake of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's deaths. There were impassioned protests, lawsuits, commissions, and bill proposals. But even with all this momentum, why are people still dying at the hands of police? Why hasn't it changed? Well, here's a hint. Follow the money to the cop lobby. In this episode of Let's Connect, we're going to connect police violence over here to the lobby that represents cops over here. Cop lobbies are terrified by perceived efforts to chip away at their discretion and power, even if that power is fatal. They try to argue that attempts to change the criminal legal system, be it redirecting budget resources or implementing transparency measures, makes it harder to do their job. So they purchase political sway and take aim at every suggestion of change, regardless of community outcry and demand. But to really understand police violence and the political power that holds us in its grip, you have to start from the beginning, the very beginning, the days of slavery. Because what the police lobby is fighting so hard to keep intact is rooted in a structure of oppression and racism that can't be fixed with a fresh coat of paint. In 1704, we begin to see the start of modern policing. Sometimes called patrollers or patty rollers, the name that would come to best describe them was slave patrols. These groups of armed, horse-mounted white men would patrol settlements and plantations, hunting down runaway enslaved people and terrorizing black people to deter revolts. They were organized, publicly funded, ruthless, and laid the foundation for policing as we know it today. Then comes 1865. The Civil War had ended and slave patrols had morphed into the designated enforcers of the newly implemented Black Codes. A series of laws meant to restrict black people's freedom and compel them to work for low wages. And over the next decades, police as an institution took on a more formal, better resourced role. But the scope of work remained horrifically unchanged. With continued violent assault on black communities and the enforcement of racist, systemically oppressive legal orders. So that was then, but what about now? Police violence is a common form of homicide in the United States. In 2020 alone, police killed 1,127 people. And in fact, there are only 18 days in 2020 that a police officer did not kill someone. And who's most affected? Well, same as the days of slave patrols, black people. Police violence is a leading killer for young men in the United States, not far behind heart disease and cancer. And that burden falls disproportionately on young black men, who are 2.5 times more likely to be killed by cops than white men. And for the last century, police misconduct and excessive use of force have sparked community outrage, followed by commissions, studies, and pledges to change. But every time, implementation falls short. And here's where the lobbies come in. Police lobbies spend millions of dollars in every city and state every year. While their agenda can include the standard fare of fatter budgets and bigger retirement packages, they often also include provisions that make transparency and change impossible. The protections they demand in local police contracts include protection from potential murder prosecution or even a firing after killing someone unnecessarily and unjustly. Here's a prime example of how the cop lobby works. While thousands were pouring into the streets, protesting the police killing of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, the local lobbyists had entered into secret contract negotiations with the city to renew their contract. At that point, police in Kentucky had already secured statewide legal protections for cops accused of misconduct. And even though the state already gives sweeping protection to cops, and even though people were yelling in the streets for change, the Louisville police would manage to negotiate changes that would delay officer interrogations by at least 48 hours, give them access to complaint reports before they were even questioned about an incident, provide them with access to their own interview transcripts so they could build a case to avert punishment and responsibility, and so much more. These provisions go way beyond the standard due process anyone accused of a crime gets. These open the doors to cops literally getting away with murder. 
And not only do these contract provisions grant cops impunity, studies have shown they could also lead to higher rates of police misconduct in the communities where they're implemented. And what about those thousands of voices calling for change? Completely ignored. That's right, there is power in the cop lobby. And that power reaches way beyond Louisville. Over the last 20 years, lobbyists representing the police spent over $3.5 million in Chicago, $19.2 million in New York City, and $64.8 million in Los Angeles to assert control over the lawmakers who are supposed to be changing police departments and harmful police practices. So what else can this influence buy? It's time to talk about the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, or LEOBOR for short. These state-issued rights make it difficult to try officers accused of using excessive force. Right now, 22 states have these rights, or ones like them. They can require the city to pay for officers' legal costs, let officers have a cooling-off period before they can be questioned, and ensure only other sworn officers can be part of any review board. These laws create a cycle of protection that allows corrupt and abusive cops to hide behind a blue wall even as they aid in the destruction of the communities they're supposed to protect and serve. The only way to end this cycle is to rein in on this power of the police lobby, and that starts with holding politicians accountable. Police contracts are not one-sided affairs. Cities and counties have to agree to these terms. Too often the mayor signing off have their sights on balancing a budget and are too eager to cave on systemic change as long as they don't have to raise salaries and pensions. We need to pressure politicians to choose public safety over lobby paydays. We also need to bring negotiations over contracts and police rights out of the shadows. Taxpayers and civilians deserve a say in how to keep their communities safe. Ending the cycle of police violence is possible, but only if we confront the power brokers and the insiders who want to keep everything just as it is. Just as it is, just isn't, and has never been good enough. On the next episode of Let's Connect, we'll talk about the actions you could take to help confront the police lobby blockade and open a way to a new kind of public safety to your city. Be sure to like and subscribe to be alerted of more videos in the future. Thank you.